I've, I've been blessed. It, it's so much to talk about. So what do you talk about? Uh, it's it, it's exciting to be here. It's exciting to share. It's exciting to proclaim the word of God. Uh, it'd be fine if someone else would do it, but it was it, it kind of fell to my turn. So we we want to do that today. You know, back in the day, you know, sometimes we. Uh, we think of the long services that some of our forefathers used to have and had and like that. But I miss them Old Testament stories that from Adam all the way down through King David all the way down and, and, and like that. I, I, I miss some of that. <clears throat> but uh, today time would not allow us to do that. So... Today, I've been led to share this morning just looking at the Old Testament in itself and looking at the times that when someone made a mistake or whatever, and it was the Messiah was promised and, and, and like that. And to start the message this morning, we want to start at the creation, the creation story. Just a few verses there where man fell, and where there was a promise giving, given of a Messiah. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. And we know the story there, how uh, the serpent, it was, the, the, the serpent was there and, begot, and, and tempted Eve, and, and, and God had plainly told them, what to do and what not to do and like that. But the serpent, it says, is more, was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field. And he said, hath God said, hath God said. We had a message recently about that, about hath God said and like that. But we won't go into all of that. But I just want to look at the fall of man. There when there was a first sin there and what... Uh, what God meant when he said that in verse 14 and 15, we'll read in Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15. And the Lord said unto the serpent, this was after the man blamed his, the wife and the wife blamed the serpent. And now God is um, actually uh, judging or casting judgment on the situation because of sin. And verse 14, we'll break in there. And the Lord God said unto the servant, Because thou hast done this, thou cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of their, thy life. I'm wondering, how was the serpent before this? I don't know. It'd be, uh, be interesting to know. Someone says... He, you know, according to studies, a beautiful creature. But uh, I don't know that. But we do know that he was going to crawl on the belly the rest of his life. And it's something about a serpent or a snake or something. It's just in us as humans to recoil from that. And, and I think it's a reason for that. Then the great promise in verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Brothers and sisters, do we comprehend what this is talking about? You know, we talk about a lot of things. Um, Christ was the seed of the woman. Christ was in that lineage, the seed of the woman. And in Christ. We're going to hear today of his suffering and death. He was bruised greatly, greatly even died and gave his life for us. We're going, we're going to hear that today. So, in a sense, the heel was bruised. But, brothers and sisters, when the Lord rose again and came out of the grave, when he, was, when he burst forth from the grave, why? I would like to say this. It crushed the serpent's head. 
It, there was power there. There was victory. The, 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 the devil and his angels had no power whatsoever. And the Bible says plainly that if they would have known that the Lord of glory would raise again, they would have never, would have never put him to death. You know, that, that's a blessing to me. Sometimes we think, well, the devil knows all about us and those things, but there are certain things the devil doesn't know. The devil didn't know Christ was going to raise again. He doesn't know everything. God is the only one that knows everything. <clears throat> so here we have a promise. That the Messiah was going to come. And can you imagine Adam and Eve. As they seen that promise. They were looking for the Messiah. And they lived and they lived and they lived. 900 years I think Adam lived. And he was looking for the Messiah. But it didn't come in his time. Finally Adam died. And then the generation after generation. Generation went. Roughly 4,000 or more years later was before Messiah came. So God doesn't necessarily work in time as far as the way we think, but he's always faithful and what he promises always comes true. We must move on. Let's turn to Genesis 12, another instance there, Genesis 12. Abraham there, talking about Abraham and and, and like that, in uh, Genesis 12, verse 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of the country and from the kindred, and thy, from thy father's house, and to a land I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How is that possible? In Abraham shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How is that possible? The faith of Abraham, his faithfulness, and he was in the lineage of Christ. When Christ was here, he, it was prophesied that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, Greek, Gentile, uh, black or white or whatever, all, everybody's going to be blessed. And it's such a blessing. <clears throat> when we think of being Abraham's children, I think the Bible, when he prophesies that, I think it's talking about the true church of Jesus Christ. That was what Abraham, it, it says in Hebrews, that Abraham was plainly seeking a better country. He was plainly seeking something that was Made without hands, he was plainly seeking, he, he was a sojourner here, and that's the example that he left for us. We shouldn't be so attached to the things around us. We need to have our focus on things above. That's what Abraham did. Let's move on to another scripture in Isaiah. <clears throat> There's many scriptures that we could turn to. I uh, prayed about it, and it seemed like these are the scriptures the Lord laid on my heart this morning. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Now this is a, this talks about Messiah, and it talks about how things are going to be when the Messiah comes and when there's peace on Earth, when there's peace among Christians and things like that. Let's read uh, Isaiah 2, verse 1 through 4. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall say, Come ye, let us go into the mountain of the Lord. Go to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and he will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and out of the, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat the swords into plowshares.
think that this is talking about the church of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. How many people, how, how, how can you imagine someone that is wicked, someone that is cursing, someone that is fighting, comes to the foot of the cross and gives their heart to Jesus? And this was prophesied that when Jesus comes, the church would be established and it would be peace in the church. It would be peace. We wouldn't have to have war no more. We would not lift ourselves up against each other, but we'd layer things down. We can forgive each other and we can move forward. That's the reason it's so important that the church of the living God is a bright example to the world and the chaos around us. That's the reason it's important for us to love the brother, love each other. And brothers and sisters, are we truly living this? Can we actually say here in a Faith Haven Christian Fellowship and in the Waverly Mennonite uh, church there, can we actually say that neither shall they learn war anymore? Is it peace at home? Is it, is it peace? Is it peace here? That's the way it needs to be. The church of Jesus Christ, we look out for each other. And, it, and whosoever will can come in and from, the, from whatever corner of the earth they want to come in can come into this beautiful place, this beautiful church of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what does it say here? Verse 3, and many people shall say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. This was prophesied. Isaiah prophesied this, and we will walk in his paths. Is that our desire? For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's talking about the church of Jesus Christ. And this is talking about... Christ and his word will judge, and he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. You know, a lot of people, and it says, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. In other words, the fighting that was being done now is turned around, is made into plowshares, and now it's turned around to cultivate the church of Jesus Christ. It's turned around that, that where we can be at peace with one another. And their spears into pruning hooks. You know, pruning hooks is something, you, you prune something to make it better. And sometimes we as a church need to prune each other to make us a little better. But all this takes place. And I just like the last part. Neither shall they learn war anymore. That's a peace. That is a peace that we can have. Even before you were converted, and it's a shame, even after we're converted, sometimes we see fightings amongst us and stuff. It shouldn't be what's named among us. There should be peace. When we come to Jesus, the judge of all, the leader of the church, the one that is the cornerstone of the church, one that was prophesied, the one that gave his life, we're going to be reminded of that. It, there is peace and contentment in that. <clears throat> now we want to turn to a very familiar scripture and don't want to get into what Brother Tim is wanting to share, but this was in the Old Testament. I want to share this in Isaiah 52, the last few verses in Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Here it gives us a picture of our Lord and Savior, what he went through for me and for you. Isaiah 53, starting in Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many as were a stone, that the, the, his vintage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which hath been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. This familiar scripture we're fixing to read in Isaiah 53. Brothers and sisters, let's make this personal. <clears throat> this was prophesied in Isaiah 
I'm not sure. I didn't study how long Isaiah was before Christ came. Um, it uh, Normally it gives an estimated time. The estimated time in my chain reference Bible says 760 B.C. That is uh, what the, uh, the author of the chain reference Bible put up. 7, 712 B.C. They got a question mark there beside that. So approximately, this was around 700 years before Christ came. There was prophesied exactly what would take place and everything. And it's such a blessing that that the Spirit of the Lord worked in the prophets and things like that. Let's read. Who hath relieved our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Let's stop there. Picture Christ going to the cross. Crown of thorns on his head. Beat up body, blood stains, stripes, tattered clothes. You, you can just about paint any picture you want. Definitely wasn't a beautiful thing. Let's read on. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Let's not ever think that we didn't have part of this. We were all in this. <clears throat> Surely he hath borne our griefs. Let's put our name in there. Surely he hath borne Raymond's grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. The things that we done wrong. The things that we deserve to be bruised. We deserve to die. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon us and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Brothers and sisters, do we catch that? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are all here in this picture. There's not one here that's good enough that it's not in this picture. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on on him the iniquity of us all, everybody, the whole world. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He brought as a lamb to, he he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich his death, because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. For thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11. He, I think this is God, shall see the travail of his soul as he was looking on and shall be satisfied. Our redemption was finished. God was satisfied. By his knowledge shall man, my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. I hope each one of us put ourselves in that, and we can get a picture of that. Let's move on. I see we must <clears throat> move on. <clears throat> 
I think we're going to go on. We're going to skip a few things here. We're going to go to Malachi 3. And the reason I chose this scripture is because we had, um, as we think of this week's meetings, as Brother David shared, and I, I just thought this was so good, Malachi 3, 1 through 6. It's also talking about, <clears throat> about a mosaic or, or Christ's prophecies, and then it's talking about uh, how things shall be and, and, and like that. And let's just read verses 1 through 6 in Malachi 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye shall delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appear? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. We heard the other evening about wood, hay, and stubble. We heard about gold, silver, and precious stones. And how is our work going to, is it going to stand the test of fire here uh, when Christ came, uh, it, he, he's as a fire. His, it purifies itself. It, it, it burns all the dross away. In verse 4, let's read on. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old as, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment and be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. And widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. Fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord. I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He's promising us if we follow him, he will not consume us. I want it to turn back <clears throat> and refer yet a little bit about the Passover. Turn to Exodus 12. And we want to read <clears throat> a little bit here in Exodus 12, 1 through 14 about the Passover and comparing the Passover lamb to Christ giving, giving his life for us. And we are not going to say a lot about it, but we want to read this scripture in Exodus 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregations, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the land, let him and his neighbor next unto him take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall see it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sudden at all with water, but roast with fire his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be a to, to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when you see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague that shall not be upon you, to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, and you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance for other, forever. Brothers and sisters, this morning, we want, to, we, we want to commemorate the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this Passover points 
forward to the ultimate sacrifice that Christ gave. And it says here, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's the same way today. When, when we come to the end of the life and we sit before the judgment seat of Christ, when, when God sees the blood of the Lamb that is covered all of our sins, He will say, come, come. But if the blood is not applied, there will be a second death. There will be a death, brothers and sisters. So if anyone's here that hasn't applied the blood, get ready. And I think today, as we commemorate the suffering and death of the Lord Jesus Christ, I think it takes the place of commemorating the Passover. I think it's, it's the thing that we need to commemorate in this new dispensation. <clears throat> It goes on and teaches that we need to teach this to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. Let's do that, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> I think that's all we have at this point. I failed to announce that we want to have a song between the messages and... Uh, Brother Titus, after prayer, could you lead us in a song? I have a song ready for us. And then um, after prayer, we'll stand and ask Titus to lead us in a word of song. And then if there's anyone needs to use a restroom or things like that, this would be a good time to do that. Which after that, I'm going to turn the time over to Randall. And uh, we'll go from there. So... Uh, Let's kneel for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this time. We thank you for your goodness, love, mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you are here. We thank you that you have given your life to us. That we're here commemorating your suffering and death, Lord, and Lord. That by your strength, you will know. We deserve death, yet still you took the place. Yet still, dear God, you were looking upon the scene, you were at us. Oh, Lord, you accept the ultimate, the ultimate sacrifice that our Lord and Savior gave us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to apply this to our lives. Always be grateful and thankful. Be faithful. Give us more if they were sure to Give us the strength and courage to hold the song. We just now want to commit the rest of this service to you, to Brother Tim, as he leads out, sharing some of the Let's bless him in a special way. We look forward to the time. Message through our lives. We want to commit ourselves to you. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Number 350.
Christian greetings to each one here this morning. It's a blessing to have everyone here, and especially you Waverly brethren. Welcome. We welcome you to worship our Lord and Savior with us here this morning. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. It's a blessing what we've heard already. We have Brother Tim Yoder here from Waverly, Tennessee, and we're going to ask him to come forward for a word of prayer. Congregation can stand. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come to you, Lord, we're so grateful, Lord, for the blessings that we've already heard and we've received today. You've blessed us with a beautiful, gorgeous day. And we just thank you for that even, Lord, and we thank you for this time with our brother here about to share. I pray that you would just bless him, undergird him with strength and courage and an unction from on high, Lord. And I pray as he shares with us the suffering and death of Jesus or whatever he's, you have laid upon his heart, I pray that we would be ready to receive that. Just bless him in a special way and help us all to receive it according to your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings to each one in the name of Jesus, our precious Savior. It's a blessing to be here this morning, this beautiful Lord's Day morning the Lord has blessed us with. Thank you for your invitation to join you for this special occasion. And I trust that as we continue to look into God's word, that God will have a blessing for us. Appreciate what the brethren have shared already this morning. Notice we, we often, when we get up here, we say greetings in the name of Jesus or something to that effect, greetings in Christ's name. And I was thinking about that this morning. You know, suppose we would get up here and we would speak in some other name. What does that really mean when we say greetings in the name of Jesus? What are we saying? What if we would get up and we would say we greet you in uh, Menno Simon's name or Jacob Amon or Conrad Grebel or St. Peter or the Apostle Paul? We're not speaking in those names. Yes, those are men we appreciate. We appreciate what those men have, have taught and stood for in their lifetime. But those are men who were mortal men and they have died and gone on to eternity. But this morning, when we speak in the name of Jesus, we're speaking in the name of one who is living. And I'm thankful this morning that we have a living Savior and that we can speak in his name. And I um, recently read an article about that where the writer was saying when we use that phrase, we're saying that we're bringing the message of Jesus. And I believe that's what it should mean. But that also does give us a responsibility then when we come we speak in the name of Jesus that we speak his message and not our message. And that's my prayer and desire this morning that this could be God's message. And I trust you've been praying for the service this morning and for the message and will continue to, to do so as we look at God's word. As Brother Raymond said, there is so much to share. It's hard to know where to start, where to stop what to leave, <clears throat> but I'd like to begin this morning with, in this message in Hebrews chapter 9, and I appreciate what uh, the brethren have shared already, appreciate those thoughts from the Old Testament, thankful that, that we have a God, as we heard in the devotional, a God who is merciful, a God who is powerful, a God who has provided for our salvation, and uh, then as Brother Raymond pointed out, the fall of man. We know the story, but I think we do well to, to be reminded of that many times, that how God created man and placed man in the Garden of Eden and, and man sinned. <clears throat> and so we have that separation between God and man. And man ever since then has been trying to get back into or to earn back God's favor. How do we, what does it take to do that? And I think we've already heard some of that this morning. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, I'd like to read verse 1 through 14. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly or earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the temp table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden rot, pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. 
and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the, other, as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the sacrifice or that did the service, pardon me, perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls, of, of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, I think we'll drop down to verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So here we have the, the beautiful story of the perfect sacrifice. And I've entitled a message this morning, The Acceptable Sacrifice. Cain and Abel brought their offerings, and the Bible says that one was accepted, but one was not accepted. <clears throat> and we, we could wonder, we can ask the question, I've heard the question, why was Cain's offering not accepted? Was it because it was not an offering of blood? Did they understand that? How much did they know what was expected in that offering? I don't know all those details, but we do see quite clearly that Cain had a heart problem. God told Cain, if thou doest well, should thou not be accepted? But we see Cain, in Cain's response, I believe it tells us a lot about his heart condition, his attitude. The Bible says that Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Cain was angry because God did not accept his sacrifice. Cain seemed to feel entitled to God accepting his offering. Cain was, was not, did not show remorse. He wasn't sorry. He didn't say, oh God, what did I do wrong? How can I please you? But it seems that, that Cain was proud and he was angry and he felt that he should be accepted. And we see that further when he rose up in anger and killed his brother Abel <clears throat> because of the jealousy and the anger that was in his heart. And so we see that God, yes, God wants offerings. And um, we heard in, in the earlier message that God commanded the, the Israelites to sacrifice a lamb and to, to eat the Passover. And there were other offerings and sacrifices that were commanded throughout the Old Testament. And God was pleased with those when people came to him on God's terms. But there are a number of Old Testament scriptures, and we won't take time to turn to all of them. I have a few of them copied here, where God says he had cannot accept the sacrifices and the offerings that people brought. In 1 Samuel 15, we have the account of Saul, where Saul said that the people saved the animals when they were supposed to utterly destroy the Amalekites. They saved the animals, he said, because they wanted to offer them to God. They were going to do a lot of offering and sacrifices, according to what Saul said, at least. But Samuel replied, 
Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So that was not an acceptable offering to God, even though Saul seemed to think they had quite a liberal offering there to bring. In Isaiah chapter 1, God says, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me, the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And so here again, they were seemingly putting in a lot of effort to please God and to bring sacrifices and offerings to God. But God says, I'm not pleased with them. I can't accept that. It's not sufficient because there was something wrong in their hearts and in their lives. Jeremiah 6, verse 20, To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba and the sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. Again, they were offering, they were bringing their offerings, but God said they're not acceptable. Amos 5, verse 21 through 23. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat feasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. So again, we see people trying to bring offerings to God, and God says, no, I can't accept that. He said, I hate your feast days, and I will not accept your burnt offerings, offerings that were not acceptable. Malachi 1, verse 10, Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught, neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught? I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. <clears throat> and so, how can we bring an offering? Can we bring an offering that God will accept? What is the offering that God is looking for throughout the Old Testament? Now, there are many cases in the Old Testament, too, where we could, many scriptures we could turn to, where God was pleased with their sacrifices, and God did forgive their sins in the Old Testament. <clears throat> I don't believe that that in the Old Testament, that they had to live under the condemnation and the guilt of sin. The the Old Testament is clear also that there was forgiveness. When they met God's conditions, and they came to God in faith, trusting in the promises that we heard about this morning, that there would be a Redeemer. Psalm 51, David's prayer of repentance, he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. And he goes on to say more about the forgiveness of sins and the joy that was restored when God forgave his sin. So again, what is the acceptable, offering, the acceptable offering to bring us back into a right relationship with God? And the New Testament, the Pharisees thought that they were pleasing God with their service. They were adding a lot of laws, a lot of details to God's laws to make sure they do everything just right. And they thought surely God would be pleased with all that. But Jesus reprimanded them many times and Jesus said, to his disciples, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> so God is looking for something more than that, more than just a lot of detail and, and being very careful to try to do everything 
just right. Back here to Hebrews chapter 9 again. Tells us very clearly that in the Old Testament there was the there was the tabernacle, and the uh, and the different things that were in the tabernacle, and how the high priest would go into the holy of holies once every year, not without blood, because he says in verse eight, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. We know how the Bible tells us that when Jesus died, that veil that went into the holy of holies was rent from the top to the bottom. It was split wide open to open the way into the Holy of Holies for all of us to now come into the presence of God because of what Jesus did for us. <clears throat> Verse 9 and 10 says, those things were only a figure of the, the real offering that was to come. And I've thought of this as a somewhat like a check that we use today if we purchase something if, uh, if I were to, to buy a car from Brother Ernie and write him a check for $5,000, I suppose he'd probably accept that as payment. Today, it's hard. If, you, if it's a total stranger, people don't want to take a check because you know, you're not sure of the value of that check. But usually, if it's a church brother, we would accept that as payment. So what would he do with that check? Would he frame it and hang it on the wall and tell people, this is what I got for that old car, I got $5,000, look at that check. We would say, well, you know, that check is just a piece of paper. In and of itself, it is of no value, but it's the faith that there's something behind that check backing it up that would give us the faith to accept it as payment. But unless we take it to the bank and we deposit it, it's of no value to us. <clears throat> And it's a lot that way, I think, with the Old Testament. Sacrifices and offerings, in and of themselves, they were of no value. Like it tells us here in Hebrews, the blood of bulls and goats, that didn't take away their sins. But because it was a type of the real sacrifice to come, and because of their faith in the real sacrifice to come, it was valid. And it did bring God's blessing when they offered those those um, offerings in that way, in faith, but without the blood of Jesus, it would have been just as worthless as that little piece of paper that we call a check if we don't have something behind it of value to back it up and to make it valid. <clears throat> but I'm thankful this morning for that blood of Jesus that makes God's promises valid. Now, <clears throat> there are many scriptures in the New Testament and we could spend the rest of our time just reading those scriptures that tell us that the acceptable offering for our sins is the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the only acceptable offering that we could ever come up with to earn, not earn, but to, to again receive. We don't earn it, but it's a gift from God to receive God's favor and God's blessing, acceptance. Acts 20 verse 28 refers to the church to the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That's the price that was paid for us. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 10, 10, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all, we are sanctified. 1 Peter 1. cleanseth us from all sin. Revelation 1, verse 4, 5, and 6, which is part of it here. He, re, he has washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Going from what we were, do we have a picture? Do we have a clear vision of what we were, what we are without Christ. Sometimes maybe it's a little harder for us to see that if we've grown up in, in Christian homes, and that's a tremendous blessing. I'm thankful to have had that blessing to grow up in a Christian home and be taught of the Word of God from our childhood. And yet even then, without Christ, we're sinners, we're cut off from God, and there would be no hope 
were it not for the blood of Christ. <clears throat> and what his blood has done here, he says, he's, he's taken us from a life of sin, cleansed us, and made us kings and priests unto God, given us a position in the kingdom of God, in the family of God, because of his love and his mercy. Not something we could earn, not something we could work out, but because he loved us first. <clears throat> now, as we think of these, the sufferings of Christ, <clears throat> and I know we don't have time to go through that in detail, I, I admire preachers who can expound on his, the suffering of Christ and lay it out in detail, and I, and I always have a problem doing that. I guess I tend to get too detailed, and, and I, there's not enough time to cover everything. There's so much in that, and yet we do want to look at that. I'd like to turn to John chapter 13. And we want to look at least at, at some of the suffering that Christ endured, the price that he paid. <clears throat> he was willing to come to this earth. He was willing to experience that rejection that Brother Raymond read about in, in Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected of men. And here in John 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come. Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus knew before he came to this earth. He knew what the price would be. He knew that he would be despised and rejected of men. He knew that he would suffer. He knew that, that he would die on the cross. <clears throat> But Jesus also said in John chapter 10, he said, I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. He came to give his life. They didn't take his life. Here in, in uh, John, we see in the, in the other Gospels, we see what we call the, the arrest of Jesus. They came and, and arrested him and led him away. They really didn't arrest him. He wasn't under their power. He gave himself under their power, and he voluntarily <clears throat> went with them to give his life for us. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep, and we are privileged to be of those sheep today. John 13 here, he says he knew his hour was come. And then the following verses, we, we have him washing the disciples' feet, and one of the brethren will share more on that later. We go to verse 21. It says, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. I believe that was a burden on his heart to know that one of the twelve would betray him. <clears throat> and again, that was something he knew all along. He knew from the beginning who it would be that, that would betray him. And he revealed there, when they asked him, that he revealed that it would be Judas. And then in verse 30, it says that Judas went out, he re having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Verse 31, therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said. And now Jesus begins to speak to his disciples. <clears throat> In the rest of, of chapter 13 and chapter 14, chapter 15, 16, and 17, Jesus is speaking only to the disciples and he's speaking in a very personal way. And he's not speaking in parables. And one of them commented at one point about, them, about that. He said that to Jesus, now you speak plainly. You're not speaking in parables. We're understanding what you're saying, although they, they still didn't understand all of it. <clears throat> but as I, as I read through these chapters, 14, 15, 16, and 17, it just had an, a renewed meaning to me as I realized these were his final words just before he knew that he would be going to the cross. <clears throat> so this was really the heart of Jesus. If Jesus was, was really feeling deeply at this point for his disciples and for you and I today as well. <clears throat> and Lord willing, we might look at, at more of these in these chapters this evening. There's so much in John 14, 15, 16, and 17 that show us his love, his care for us, his desire for us to know the Father, his desire for us to be with him, his provisions 
so that we can be where he is. He says that several times. So that we can bear fruit that glorifies God. So that we can be in unity as his followers. So that we can love each other. So that we need not be of the world, even though we're in the world. His prayer is that we're not of the world, but even though we are in the world, we shine as lights for him. And by his life, his love, his working in our lives, he says, that's how the world will see truth. That's how the world will know because of what they see in us. That was his heart. That, I believe, is still his heart today. It was important to him. How important was it? So important that he was willing to go through what the next chapters describe as his suffering and his death. Chapter 18 <clears throat> is when he, Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where there was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And, and different of the Gospels record different details. And one of the Gospels, Matthew, I believe it is, tells us how Jesus told the disciples to, to wait here. He took Peter, James, and John, went a little further, and then told them to stay there. And he went yet a little further, and he prayed that prayer. Father, <clears throat> it said, if, if it were possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. <clears throat> and he prayed that prayer three times. And, and I believe there was, there was a struggle in his heart. Jesus was, yes, he was the son of God, but he was also a human. He had a human body, and he knew what was ahead. And yet, even knowing what was ahead, he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. He gave himself. <clears throat> and then we have here in verse 2 through 9, the officers coming that, G that Judas had brought. Judas brought them and, and uh, showed them where Jesus was. And Jesus asked them in verse 4, Whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus saith unto them, I am he, Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. You would think at that point they'd be ready to go home. But we can see how blind they were. Even though they saw the power of God, yet they, they were blinded to that seemingly <clears throat> and persisted in their mission of taking Jesus with them. Jesus went with them voluntarily. Verse 10 tells us how Peter had a sword. He, he smote the high priest's servant. He cut off his right ear. And one of the, the Gospels tells us that Jesus picked up that ear and he healed that ear. And I've wondered what happened with that servant later. Do you think he could go on in life as before? I would hope that he was part of the New Testament church. I don't know, <clears throat> but we would think surely. That would have spoken to him as well as the others that were there. Peter followed from a distance. We see a lot of fear in Peter here. Peter denied Jesus three times. He denied that he knew him, that he had anything to do with him. But then Peter repented <clears throat> from that. And later we see a spirit-filled Peter who was bold and fearless in standing up for Jesus and finally gave his life for Jesus. <clears throat> They led Jesus to Pilate's hall, verse 28. And first to, to Caiaphas, how, to Anna's house, and then to Caiaphas' house. And then to Pilate's hall, verse 28, we see their, their hypocrisy. It says they took him to the hall of judgment, but they didn't want to be defiled because it was the time of the Passover, and so they didn't go inside. They were very concerned about the details of the law, <clears throat> but couldn't see the, the own, the own, their own need in their heart. They accused him. Pilate asked, what accusation bring you against this man? They said, if he were not a malefactor, and that original word, understand, means a criminal. If he wouldn't be a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you, which was a very vague answer. They couldn't really give a satisfactory answer. Pilate had a dilemma here. He was faced with truth, and I believe that Pilate knew that this was not an ordinary criminal. And Pilate tried to get out of it several different ways. He sent him to, to Herod, and Herod asked Jesus some questions, and Jesus wouldn't answer. And he sent him back to Pilate, 
Pilate's wife warned him, don't have anything to do with that man. Pilate took a bowl of water and he washed his hands and he said, I'm free. I, I wash my hands and I'm free of the blood of this man. <clears throat> but was he? Pilate still had a responsibility. But Pilate gave in to the demands of the people and they led Jesus away to crucify him. <clears throat> Now, again, there's, there's much detail here that we could look at before they did that. It says in chapter 19, verse 1, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. They, they whipped him with, with whips that we're told had pieces of metal or pieces of bone tied into it. And <clears throat> he was beaten very cruelly. They, they plaited a crown of thorns. They put it on his head. They put on him a purple robe. They mocked him. And in verse 5, Jesus came forth wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. And I wonder what Pilate was really thinking when he said that, Behold the man. I think Pilate knew in his heart that this must be God's son, or certainly was more than an ordinary person. <clears throat> in... Verse 17, 18 of chapter 19, bearing his cross, he went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and the two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the middle. Crucifixion was apparently a, a common form of execution in, the, in that day. It's one of the probably the most cruel method, the most painful, torturous death that is known to man. <clears throat> and that's what Jesus chose to submit to for the price that was to be paid for, for your sin, for my sin. And as we heard this morning, we were all part of this. And as Jesus was hanging on that cross, he prayed this prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I often thought, you know, that, that was a tremendous prayer to pray about those soldiers that had just nailed him to the cross. Those soldiers that had just beaten him so cruelly <clears throat> and mocked him and ridiculed him. But, you know, it wasn't just for those soldiers. It was you and me, too. It was for all of us. I was included in that prayer. <clears throat> Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was bearing my sins just as well as those soldiers sins <clears throat> and as he hung there on the cross it says they they had offered him vinegar mixed with wine probably something that that apparently they offered to the criminals to possibly dull the pain just a bit Jesus refused to drink that <clears throat> but then later when he was on the cross it tells us again that they they filled a sponge with vinegar and that he did drink he took that, and then he said, it is finished. It is finished. The work was finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He died. He gave, up his, he gave his life for you and I. And the veil was rent. The way was opened. And the centurion standing by said, truly, this was the Son of God. <clears throat> People could see that the power of God even there at, at the death of Christ. <clears throat> and a few days later, certainly, when he rose again, the power of God was evident. And even yet through all that, the Jews continued, many of them continued to, to still reject him. Jesus said, it is finished. What was finished? The offering was complete. A, an offering that was acceptable to God. I'd just like to read again that beautiful verse that that was already shared this morning from Isaiah 53, verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Shall be satisfied. <clears throat> and I believe that's a verse that we can claim today. God is satisfied with the offering that was offered for our sin. We don't have to work to earn his favor. We cannot work enough to earn God's favor. The price has been paid. The acceptable offering has been made. It is finished, Jesus said. We can't add anything to that offering. Yes, we, we come to God and we offer our lives and we give our lives in service to God. 
in appreciation for what he has done for us, and that is, I believe, our responsibility and, and opportunity. <clears throat> and that's, Lord willing, what we want to look at a little more this evening. But we do not add anything to the offering that has already been made for our sins. That price is paid, God is satisfied, and no matter how hard we work to try to earn more of God's favor, it is finished, it is complete. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, and the price was paid for our redemption. <clears throat> and I'm thankful that the story doesn't end there, but we know the rest of the story, how they came, they took the body of Jesus, and they placed it in the tomb, and then the, the Jews were still afraid that something would happen that uh, would make it look like Jesus rose again. And so they requested that there would be guards placed there at the tomb, and, and Pilate granted them their request. And so they had guards there to, to guard the tomb <clears throat> so that nobody would come and steal the body of Jesus and say that he rose again. But we know that when the power of God came down, those guards were helpless. And the Bible says that they, it, one of the Gospels records that, that they fell backwards. They were powerless. They were as dead men, I think maybe it says. <clears throat> And Jesus rose from the dead. And today we serve a risen Savior, one who has paid the price. He has given the acceptable sacrifice, and now he has won the power over death. Over death and over sin. So I just thank God for that price that has been paid. And I'm thankful that today God is a satisfied God, not because of, of who I am, not because of who we are, what we can do, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Shall we kneel together for a word of prayer? <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, your blessings, this opportunity to be together this morning to worship you, and again, especially to be reminded of the great price that has been paid for our redemption. We thank you so much for Jesus, who was willing to come to this earth, though he knew what he would face, and he knew the suffering that he would endure, and yet he did it willingly. He gave his life. No man took it from him, but he gave it because of his love for us. Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you again for that. Father, we pray for your continued presence and blessing here this morning. We desire that your name be glorified. We commit this service to be Pray. Turn the time back to Brother Raymond and invite you to uh, give correction as well if you said anything that is not scriptural. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Tim, for sharing. Behold the man. Brother Tim shared what Pilate said. I wonder what went through Pilate's man, uh, mind as well. Behold the man. <clears throat> Our Savior was dead at one time. But I appreciate the emphasis put on, but he's not in the grave today. He's the only one of all the religions out there that people follow that is alive forevermore. <clears throat> In John 14, 6, brings out that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by him. So Jesus is the only way. Today we hear a lot of that as long as you're on a way, you can get to God. But let me tell you something. Jesus is the only way. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11. Verses 23 through 26. 
For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus is the same night in which he betrayed, took bread, and when he had given it, when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. That do you as oft as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Brothers and sisters, this morning, we want to keep this commandment that we want to show the Lord's death till he come. One day, just like he came, uh, when I talked this morning about Adam and being old and finally died and Christ didn't come, but the time came when Christ did come. And let me tell you something, as it says here, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. He's coming back, brothers and sisters, just like he came and gave his life. The the sky will open up and Christ will come back and receive his own unto himself. We don't know exactly how all that will be, but we know one thing. If we're ready to go, we'll be glad to see him how he is. <clears throat> we want to prepare ourselves for the uh, communion table. And we're going to do a little different today. Uh, we're going to ask the song leader as we're coming around and uh, accepting the bread and grape juice that there would be a song song, maybe something by memory as that process is going on. Can you do that, Brother Titus? Yeah, thank you for that. <clears throat> we appreciate that. So at this time, all those that are Waverly Church, the locals here, the ones that are taking part of communion, you can prepare yourself and stand at this time. 